Our final speaker today is Dr. Tony Hompier. Um, he's done his graduate training in Karen Wilcox Lab at the University of Utah and is currently a postdoc in Long Jun Wu's lab at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Uh, a fun fact about Tony, uh, he has 0% success rate at making bread during the pandemic. And his first loaf was actually used as a doorstop. All right, I'm looking forward to, to your talk, Tony. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, can you see my screen okay? All right. So, yeah. Um, so, thank you for uh, the ability to share my work today about microglial calcium signaling and its attunement to neuronal activity. Um, if you want to use video, I stuck this area right up in the top right corner for you to put your video screen so that it doesn't cut off any any text. All right, so um, the other speakers today have done a really great job of introducing a number of different facts about microglia. Uh, today, I kind of wanted to tailor my introduction to one idea, which is the structural dynamics of microglia when they are sort of responding to changes in the molecular environment. So one of the classic sort of experiments with microglia is that um, during damage responses, like um, sticking an ATP pipette into a brain slice or doing laser burn in live tissue, you see this really dynamic convergence of microglial processes towards that point source. And along a similar line of, of uh, information, we also find that microglia have structural outputs when you do uh, introduce hypoactivity like isoflurane or hyperactivity as Anna described with seizures, microglia also have dynamic structural outputs. And so what does this really look like? So first of all, uh, one of the postdocs in the lab, um, AO, first described a few years back that microglia processes can have unique structural responses to hyperactivity. So when he took a brain slice with these green um, CX3, CR1 microglia and these red thigh one neurons, and he introduced one millimolar molar glutamate to the slice by bath application, what he found was this hyperactivity induced a very interesting phenomena. As you can see from these little bulbous or filopodia like tip ends, microglia processes uh, primarily engage with phi one excitatory neurons. So you have this structural output of microglia and its preferential sort of surveillance of these, of these local neuronal somas. On the other hand, Yang, another postdoc more recently described what happens on the other end of activity. So if you take the awake animal that you're imaging with a two photon microscopy, and now you introduce isoflurane at levels used uh, around the levels used uh, in two photon anesthetized imaging, what you can do is actually increase the output of microglial processes. They enlarge and they start to survey more area of the parenchyma. So oddly enough, both increasing or decreasing neuronal activity both leads to sort of a structural engagement and output of microglia. On the other hand, when I started my postdoc in the lab, I kind of, I've always been interested in secondary messenger systems and how these sort of structural dynamics are, are complemented and further informed by functional signaling. So I started in the lab using GCAMP6S in awake animals and uh, two photon microscopy to look at how calcium dynamics inform us of what microglia respond to and sort of the latencies and some of the other finer details therein. Um, here's what we know about microglia calcium. Uh, as our recent paper and a number of other papers have shown, uh, microglia spontaneous calcium activity is pretty low especially when you compare it to astrocytes or neurons. This is a GCAMP6S in the cortex of an awake uh, animal running under the two-photon scope. So we only see, I'll play that one more time, we only see one or two microglia having a spontaneous calcium transient in about a 15-minute period, really low compared to astrocytes or neurons in the awake animal. 
But what we do know is that microglia calcium isn't categorically low under all circumstances. There's a number of ways you could elevate that signaling modality. So th things that sort of mimic or are local damage, like a millimolar ATP, laser burn, neuron ablation, these can all sort of en engender more calcium activity from microglia. Inflammation is another way to do this. If you introduce LPS into the animal or increase inflammasome activity, you get more calcium signaling in microglia. And even more recently, in the past year or so, another really interesting uh, sector of this research has come out where the natural process of aging alters microglial spontaneous calcium and proximity to amyloid plaques as well. So there's a lot of different ways that microglia are engaged and alter their calcium signaling. But when I looked at this, uh, one of the things I was particularly interested in was the role of neuronal activity because uh, experiments had been done on that, but they were done under anesthesia and they were somewhat conflicting between reports. So what I wanted to do was ask the question, um, does neuronal activity shifts in the awake animal alter microglial calcium activity? And if we look at it from a microdomain specific viewpoint, what does that look like? So microdomains are the processes versus soma compartment of a cell. In astrocytes, this is a really important concept because your finest processes of the astrocyte have their highest frequency of calcium activity. There's less frequent activity in major processes and there's even less activity in the soma. And that's thought to re reflect the different roles and uh, interactions these different regions play. And we wanted to know if there was any evidence that the same concept also held true in microglia. So uh, when I started these experiments, one of the first things we did was we started doing hyperactivity and increasing sort of neuronal output in uh, the animal locally or globally and looking at how it changes microglial calcium signaling. Um, Anna has already nicely introduced this. So we used canic acid, which is a, uh, when used systemically, it activates a number of AMP and canate receptors and neurons. And we were using it to the point where we would uh, get prolonged seizures or status epilepticus. So as shown in this little picture here, um, when we image neurons as a, to look at neuronal activity, so at baseline versus after canate induced seizures, we have, as you'd expect, a gigantic or 5,500% increase in their neuronal calcium activity during seizures. So we definitely have this hammer approach to increase neuronal activity. And in response, what we find is that um, microglia do indeed increase their calcium output, but it's a little bit uh, unique here. So first of all, when we look at the somata of microglia, there's a trend, but it's not significant towards higher calcium activity. On the other hand, when we look at the processes, we see about a, a threefold or a, yeah, three times increase in the calcium activity in microglial processes. So this is our first initial evidence that there might be distinctions between how processes use calcium versus somata in microglia. But as I said, canate's kind of the hammer approach to changing activity. You also uh, maybe disrupt the blood-brain barrier, you get inflammation, you have cell death, you have a bunch of things that aren't necessarily neuronal activity increases in isolation. So we also use, like in um, Anna's paper in the first figure, um, we also use CAM kinase 2 alpha GQ dread, uh, which we introduce through a virus to our excitatory neurons in cortex. And when you introduce the agonist CNO that binds preferentially, or I should say relatively exclusively to GQ dread, you can increase um, local neuronal activity we tried two different doses of CNO and they gave us a 40% and a 70% increase in excitatory activity respectively. And so what we wanted to ask was, well, when we use this approach, what does our microglial calcium do? So in this video, you're gonna see first, this is spontaneous microglial calcium activity at baseline and after CNO induced increases in neuronal activity. I'll play it through one more time, but what we see is once again, when we increase neuronal activity through the GQ dread construct, we also increase microglial calcium signaling. Now, if we flip the script and we look at hypoactivity, the other end of the other end of the spectrum, uh, we use a few different approaches to decrease neuronal activity and look at the timing and the effects of this on microglial calcium. Once again, we start with something pretty easy. Uh, we take an awake animal on the two photon, and then we uh, 
introduce a nose cone and we give the uh, mouse isoflurane to induce general anesthesia. This is uh, when we did the neuronal characterization. Um, you know, we basically were sh are showing a 90% reduction in neuronal calcium activity within a minute of uh, isoflurane induction. So pretty nice, you know, on off sort of change in activity in response. What we see is compared in this heat map, uh, these are the microglial processes. We see there's sort of low spontaneous calcium based on these little yellow dots. And about 10 minutes after isoflurane introduction, we start to see a pretty substantial increase in their calcium activity. So this is pretty interesting for two reasons. First of all, uh, this, is, this is a reduced activity. We generally think of microglia as being really interested in the purines and the higher activity, but also we can get calcium increases in cells uh, with lowered activity. And it occurs after a decent latency of about 10 minutes. And so the mechanism behind that, uh, maybe we can talk about a little bit later. Um, you know, that's definitely not real time, but it's an evolving modality. And the last thing, as I, I mentioned in a few other slides, is that there is this distinction here where the processes show about a doubling over 10, 20, 30 minutes of their calcium activity. At the same time, in the same 40 minutes of imaging, somata of microglia do not show any real changes in their calcium. So these are, appear to be distinct microdomains. And just like with excitability, we also wanted to complement um, reduced neuronal activity with another approach. In this case, we use GI dread. So we targeted GI dread to excitatory neurons of cortex using uh, CAM kinase 2 alpha GI dread virus. And when we use CNO to activate this GPCR, uh, we get hyperpolarization and less neurotransmitter release. And ultimately in our characterization studies, um, a low dose and a high dose of CNO reduce neuronal activity either 30% or 60%. And once again, let's look at what the neuronal calcium, or sorry, the microglial calcium effect is. So in this video, this is the microglial calcium in the awake baseline and after CNO. So in this case, CNO is decreasing neuronal activity, yet increasing microglial calcium elevations in their processes. I'll play that one more time. But once again, we have this sort of that bi-directional effect. So increasing neuronal activity or decreasing it both lead to elevations in microglial calcium activity. So while we have a long ways to go, uh, some of the first questions are sort of what is the mechanism and what is the purpose of this calcium elevation? One of our observations in doing this study that we're going to be following up on, um, calcium may well be a modifier of process motility. Um, in the literature, the early literature where calcium was studied in cultured microglia, cultured microglia often used calcium elevations for uh, motility responses. And one thing we noticed, um, I'll show you this video, if you look at this right panel, uh, microglia that have processes extending often have concomitant bursts in calcium activity play that one more time. That was one thing that kind of caught our eye. And when we sort of aggregated all of our data, so we took all of our experiments and then we started subdividing processes into those that underwent retraction during our, um, our experiment, remained stable or extended outwards. What we found across the boards was that um, in these uh, vertical bars, Processes of microglia that extended outwards had the highest magnitude of calcium activity. And in these uh, horizontal bars, they also had the highest proportion. They represented the greatest proportion of uh, processes having calcium activity. So that's true for isoflurane and GI dread studies. It also holds true for K8 and GQ dread studies. And with that, I'll just quickly summarize three main points. Uh, first of all, microglia elevate their calcium signaling as a bi-directional response to neuronal activity shifts. These changes in calcium are microdomain specific. They occur in the processes, but as shown for one hour of two photon imaging from microglia under GI or GQ dread experiments, we don't see any elevations in somata. So this is a domain specific response. And lastly, it is the processes that undergo structural outgrowth or extension that are most greatly associated with calcium activity. And with that, I'd like to thank the lab uh, my mentors and our funding sources, and thank you for your attention. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them in the chat.
Very nice talk, Tony. Um, so first of all, um, do you know if CNO or isofluorine can, can actually um, affect mi microglia directly? Yeah, that's an important question. Any so evidence on that? Yeah, so let's take CNO first. Uh, we did the control experiment where we didn't uh, introduced GI or GQ dread constructs. And then we just gave CNO into the animal without that. And we didn't see any effect on microglial calcium or neuronal calcium when we did a neuronal uh, GCAMP 6S virus to look at that aspect. So no, we didn't see any off-target effects of CNO, but that's an important point that has been brought up in the literature. Um, as for does isofluorine have direct effects on microglia? Uh, I can't exclude that, but the best known um, mechanism, uh, when we looked at, when Yang looked at um, isofluorine's effects in his uh, recent Nature Neuroscience paper, what he found was isofluorine reduced norepinephrine, um, local axons of nor or norepinephrine release. And that loss of signaling to the beta-2 receptor expressed on microglia allowed them to have a disinhibited um, effect. So it allowed microglia to grow outwards and extend their processes without beta-2 norepinephrine signaling being present. Mm -hmm. All right, some more questions coming up. Have you looked at if P2RY12 activation changes microglia uh, calcium or, or if P2RY12 knockout prevents the changes? calcium? Great question. So um, from a canonical sort of standpoint of, of intracellular signaling, P2Y12 is GIGO coupled and GIGO coupling uh, isn't uh, related to calcium from I, uh, release from IP3 stores. Uh, we plan, so I plan to, I've started some uh, slice studies where basically we're going to use P2Y12 antagonists in a number of different um, settings where we know we can evoke calcium now from, so these studies will now serve as sort of a positive control and we'll look at mechanism. Um, so we plan to do that experiment. I don't think based off canonical signaling pathways that uh, P2Y12 would influence it, but people in the literature have suggested that P2Y12 could have a calcium effect. Uh, but we plan to follow that up with a specific knockout and pharmacology. Um, there are, some thoughts in the literature that increases in intracellular microglial calcium leads to, to, to a pro-inflammatory microglia phenotype. What are your thoughts on this in context of the GI and GQ experiments? Yeah, that's definitely an interesting point. Um, the... Yeah, so in the GI and GQ experiments, what we did, because we had a really weak uh, EYFP from the CX3CR1, we could get a little bit of structural characteristics from our microglia. And so what I did is after I did the GI and GQ experiments with CNO, I just look at the mice a couple of days later to just see if there's anything particularly weird about them. So if there's long-term effects, I know uh, Anna's work has shown that the GI and GQ, or sorry, GQ activation at least led to some pretty strong transcriptional changes. Um, I didn't see any massive changes in their uh, phenotype, at least. So I mean, I could so I could only really assess pro-inflammatory from like an amoeboid sort of standpoint. Didn't see a massive change towards that. One other thing is after canate, uh, we looked for up to 21 days after canate um, status epilepticus at microglia calcium, so longitudinally in animals. And if anything, we actually saw a slightly more um, uh, have sort of elongated microglia. Our Scholl analysis showed more microglial process complexity. So they're actually a little bit more outgrown rather than amoeboid. Yeah, so that's about really all I could say without doing, you know, PCR-based analysis of transcriptional changes, yeah. Uh, as microglia extend their processes, do you, do they search for neuronal structures or for blood vessels? Yeah, so unfortunately I didn't do dual labeling experiments in this, so I can't 
answer that definitively, but in past experiments where you've introduced uh, seizures to mice, uh, like AO's uh, experiment in that second slide, uh, microglia typically are searching for, at least in the hyperexcitability end of things, they're searching for, as Anna showed, ATP, ADP sources, which normally uh, we think come from uh, microglia, or sorry, from neurons. Uh, AO has shown NMDA receptors are important in that, as well as um, uh, McVicker's group. And you seem to have calcium waves across different microglia. Are they somehow connected via nanotubes or connections? For example, that's yeah, that's interesting. I don't, I can't answer that directly. I'd also posit the other idea too that maybe where you see these bursts of localized calcium activity, maybe that also represents a localized source of ATP or another calcium activating molecule that could also maybe explain the regional uh, elevations. Mm -hmm. And have you tested the effect of increased sensory input, sensory deprivation or motor behavior? Uh, yeah, we're looking at that a little bit right now, actually. Yeah, uh, trying to yeah trying to determine that um, mostly as a way to look for if there's on top of these ten minute latencies for calcium activity, we want to know if we can do some sensory inputs that lead to real time changes in calcium. Yeah, but yeah, I don't have any answers yet. Mm -hmm. All right, and there are two more questions up. Uh, did you check for calcium changes in branches directed to uh, laser damage or phagocytic cups? Uh, we haven't done that experiment yet because um, laser damage has already been done and published. Uh, Posner et al. I think it was 2015. So um, there's definitely a laser damage calcium response. Um, I don't think they looked at the phagocytic cups though. All right, and a final question from Fee. Maybe he can uh, ask it actually. Uh, yeah, you know, awesome talk, Tony. Uh, just wondering if you've looked at, you know, micro calcium signals, you know, um, along with neuronal calcium signals. I'm just wondering um, sort of like what the time scales are if, you know, micro calcium signals, like if they're, if they immediately, pers uh, follow like neuronal calcium signals or if there's any sort of like latency? Yeah, so I mean, currently we're thinking about doing RCAMP in neurons and keeping the GCAMP in microglia and that's our ideal way to look at those real-time things. Um, but ultimately when we have done every experiment I showed you, we also did a virus GCAMP in neurons and looked at calcium um, as they weren't in the same animal, but they gave us a, a rough idea. Um, basically we can change calcium pretty rapidly. Like, so one example would be uh, the isoflurane experiment. We can knock down neuronal activity pretty much within a minute of that nose cone going on the animal. Uh, so that gives us a really nice, like pretty good zero start time. And it takes about six minutes before we find our first significant elevation to microglial calcium. And GIGQ dread, uh, it's about 15 minutes after the peak CNO based effects on neuronal calcium activity that we see changes in microglial calcium activity. So there is this 10, 15 minute latency. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting why that might occur. All right. Thank you uh, so much, Tony. That's all the questions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, that wraps up our symposium. Um, you know, thanks everyone for attending and especially our speakers for their amazing talks. Um, and of course, thanks to Ilya and Jerry, uh, Jerry for helping to bring this uh, symposium together. And uh, hopefully we'll see everyone again at the uh, next symposium.